In 5G, the core must radically change. Communication service providers have a sense of urgency in getting to 5G standalone. Many begin with 5G non-standalone, though increasingly some go straight from 4G to 5G SA. All need to plan their move influenced by technical readiness and market conditions. So how should CSPs approach their transition to 5G standalone? To discuss this topic, I'm talking today with Fran Heeren, Senior Vice President Core Networks at Nokia, and Dimitris Mavrakis, Senior Research Director at ABI Research. So uh, let's begin by setting the context. Where are we now in terms of this important transition? And did we expect to be at this stage by mid-2021? Dimitris, let's come to you first. So thanks, Ray. So we are definitely seeing an acceleration in terms of SA deployments, right, for many reasons. So first of all, uh, the infrastructure, the network elements that will enable SA are ready now by many vendors. And also the market is mature. And we are also, from the demand side, we are seeing that uh, many operators are now uh, moving to these cloud native platforms that can operate their networks in a much more efficient manner considered, you know, compared with the legacy way of, de of network deployments. So this is something we didn't expect as well. So we didn't expect SA to accelerate as fast, right? So we're seeing several uh, interested operators around the world deploying SA, and there are some, you know, a few uh, major deployments worldwide. And of course, uh, this set the scene for the next uh, wave of operator uh, enterprise strategies, for example, through uh, hybrid uh, networks, hybrid hybrid private public networks, network slicing, and so on. And, and Fran, are we at the stage where you expected the operators to be by mid-2021? No, I think, um, I think we're certainly ahead. If you asked me that question a year ago, I would have given you a different answer. And if we look at a a pretty simple statistic from our own business here in Nokia. Um, you know, even going back just six months, uh, where we already had a reasonably significant number of SA core deployments either done or in progress, that's more than doubled now in a six month period. And I think if we look at to your question on the rationale as to why has it moved faster than perhaps any of us expected, I think it's the requirements and the desire has gone beyond just purely speed, right? So 5G initially, okay, it's faster data lower latency, um, but also now the focus is on taking advantage of the 5G services. So once I have my 5G SA core deployed, I can begin to really take advantage of what those services are, you know, things like voice over new radio, network slicing and so on. So I think the desire, you know, to go beyond just the speed into the new services is one of the key drivers. But also I think a secondary driver is on the infrastructure side, which is moving away from maybe the, the legacy or traditional infrastructure that's been there, being able to have a more greenfield new build approach to building the core. And it lets us, I suppose, get into a simpler construct and again, take advantage of some infrastructure choices that we have in terms of new cloud technologies and also new delivery technologies as well. So I think all of those together have really driven this acceleration in moving from 4G through the NSA core phase and on to now predominantly 5G SA deployments. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of the drivers there. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about that? I mean, what is driving the CSP's initial timing and their urgency in transitioning to 5G standalone? Uh, Fran? Well, I think, again, those new services are, are going to be key. Um, you know, the, the, the two critical services that we see and then customers have already deployed um, standalone core we're on to the next conversation now which is what are these new services we'll deploy and there's two pretty consistent themes as to what's coming next one is um voice over new radio so as uninteresting as as voice services may seem to people these days voice over new radio is critical because it allows for much much more efficient use of both the network and the devices themselves in anchoring both voice and data traffic on the 5G network. Uh, on NSA, that's not the case. So, you know, a desire to get to a much more efficient voice service, it's pretty much a consistent theme on all of our customers today. And then secondly, network slicing is something that's been talked about a lot over the last number of years um, as, a, as a concept, I guess. With 5G SA, 
it now lets us do true end-to-end -end network slicing, which wasn't possible before. And then that in turn opens up a whole range of new services on top of these individual slices. So I would say they're the two main drivers. And then, you know, within that, you can ask them what, what applications will, will appear on top of voice and on top of these network slices. Okay, excellent. And Dimitris, from, from your perspective, uh, are you seeing anything uh, different or additional that's driving this move to, to 5G standalone? So building on Fran's comment previously is that SA uh, and you know the next generation core offers you know a break away from the legacy network, right? So instead of deploying network elements, so now operators can deploy these cloud native platforms that can enable you know CNFs, cloud native functions, right? And this is a, I guess. Uh, one of the most important improvements you know, when going from NSA to SA, because these uh, containerized network functions can scale up or scale down according to demand. And of course, they enable microservices and allow the operator to be much more agile in addressing uh, application and end user demands, right? And this is a vital point for enterprise use cases in particular, where operators need to be more agile, right? I think the whole industry now agrees that, you know, the legacy way of doing things in the telco domain is no longer valid or sufficient. And, you know, the SA core does allow them to do so, right? And again, if we think about it, you know, NSA is like having a supercar with a conventional car engine, right? So a super radio network, but at the end of the day, it's just a faster pipe when it's NSA. But with SA, it can deliver a lot more, all of these new service functionality that 5G promises. So 5G standalone distributes the, the network core's location beyond the old private central locations to nearly anywhere, including hyperscalers, public clouds. Uh, what is driving the accelerated shift towards these infrastructure options? And what does this mean for planning and delivery? Uh, so, Dimitris, let's come to you. Yeah, so there, I guess there are two aspects from this. The first aspect is from the application perspective. And we see now applications becoming much more complex and, you know, they generate a lot more data, right? So in the traditional deployment model has been to transfer all of this data to the cloud, either telco cloud or public cloud, but that no longer scales, right? And this is why 3GPP introduced what is called control and user plane separation, for example, in order to be able to process data, you know, in the local domain. And this is why many operators now are distributing their networks and for example, their UPFs, to the edge of the network in order to be able to switch and route and process traffic at the edge, right? So this is answering it from the demand side, from the supply side, from the network itself, you know, further distribution is needed, right? Especially with microservices and things like enterprise use cases and applications. So uh, this model of transferring all data, all traffic to the core, and processing it there and then you know uh, passing passing it back which i guess is called tromboning is is no longer valid for 5g and enterprise use cases and what 5g aims to be so w w at least here at abi research we think this distribution of processing capabilities for 5g will continue right will go as far as the far edge what we say uh, and Fran, what does this distributed core architecture mean for operas in, operators in terms of their, their planning and delivery? Well, I think it's more than just a physical location or distribution challenge. If we kind of step back a little bit and look at how we've been evolving, there's a, an infrastructure um, element to this as well. So, you know, the sheer number of choices of infrastructure options that are now available and being selected uh, by the operators, that started some time ago as we moved from physical then we went through virtualization and then on to cloud and cloud native and containers. There's a, there's a wide range and a mix of you know, different hardware types, um, different cloud 
middleware elements uh, and software stacks that go with that. And, and they can have different applications in these different physical locations. And that's been an ongoing, um, I suppose, challenge for both the service providers and the suppliers in being able to make sure the software can run on this ever-growing range of options. And then if we add to that the physical um, location aspect of this as well, where you now have not just you know traditional main data centers, you've got regional data centers, you've got edge, all technically on-prem for the customer, but now we also have the emergence of hyperscaler and public cloud options as well. And we've seen some recent announcements there, you know, notably one from Dish who are launching their 5G core this year on Amazon Web Services using Nokia's core. That's another range of options, both in terms of location and infrastructure. And they're offering their infrastructure as well for use both on-prem, but also within their own public cloud. So it's, it's a mix of you know, being able to disaggregate the software stack so that the, the software, the functions, the applications can run in the best location and the right location on the network, wherever that may be, but also across this wide range of different infrastructure options as well. So they're the challenges, but they're essential that we overcome and we provide solutions to those challenges because to really get the benefit of 5G and 5G SA, it's very important we can do that application function placement as best as possible. Okay, great. Now, we've already talked about the different migration routes. Uh, what is the difference between the CSPs that move straight from 4G to 5G standalone and those that take the route of non-standalone prior to a standalone deployment? Uh, Fran, what's the, what's the key difference here? Well, I think before maybe I address that, it's, it's worth saying that not everybody can make that move. You know, it's, it's certainly something we've seen is, is different approaches being taken by different service providers based largely on, you know, A, business drivers, but also their existing um, infrastructure, their existing solutions, you know, what their network looks like. Um, you know, to address the question, I think the, the obvious is a simpler transition. Um, you skip the two-step process and having to go bounce through non-standalone, then deploy standalone. So I think if, if now the standalone is available, you know, widely adopted or being widely adopted, that option is certainly there. But it's not always available to everybody to take that route. It is a simpler route. And to my earlier point, it also lets you, I, I think, look at a different set of technology choices. And you're probably a little bit freer in terms of those choices that you make in adopting things like, for example, purely cloud native, more modern infrastructure, you're not going to be held back by the existing infrastructure on the 4G core, the non-standalone core. So there, I think the key difference is the speed of movement, ease of movement, if it's possible, and then the ability to um, take maybe more choice and have a more, I suppose, pure approach to the technology elements that are deployed without having to worry about the the generational, um, you know, the, the, the multi-generational challenges presented by NSA. Okay, interesting. Uh, and Dimitris, for you, what is the difference between these two migration paths? So from a theoretical perspective, we can say that, you know, from, you know, this year, there's no reason to deploy NSA, right? So, and uh, traditionally, uh, according to our infrastructure forecasts, there's no, there's very little capex being spent in 4G, right? Most of the capex by mobile operators is spent on 5G, right? So there's no reason to go uh, to anchor, say, 5G to a 4G core, especially when SA is ready, right? So the packet core is ready. So that's from a theoretical perspective. I mean, there's no reason to go NSA this year, but you know, from a practical perspective, just like, like Fran commented, you know, there are many aspects to consider. For example, if the 4G core has reached depreciation, right? Or whether an operator can operate two cores at the same time, or they can transition to a, a fully fledged SA core that includes, you know, a 4G packet core. So, you know, there are practical issues, but obviously, going you know the one step approach is much more efficient from you know i guess all perspectives and because you know the the nsa option is an intermediate step right and that adds adds further uh, inefficiencies into the network for 5g and of course it incurs a intermediate cost that can be avoided when going to sa and i think we can all say that sooner or later, all networks will end up in SA. 
in you know the next generation core, right? So many operators, many operators we speak to around the world are, you know, finding, trying to find ways to go to SA directly. Okay, excellent. So we're reaching that point now where operators have got 5G SA deployed. Uh, for any service provider, what are the practical results and impacts of having moved to 5G standalone? Uh, Fran, what's your early experience of this? Yes, I mean, if we look at, for those customers that we're working with, certainly the ones that were the earliest movers in getting 5G SA deployed, and there are, there are a, a, quite a number of those now, um, you know, there's a pretty consistent set of conversations that we're having uh, with them. Right? I mentioned some of the, the, the basics earlier on, which is, okay, the next level of base services, voice over new radio, you know, get the efficiency on the spectrum, uh, the efficient use of the network in general, um, so that kind of catch-up exercise, I suppose, on, on the voice service is, is one area. And then slicing, I mentioned already. But if you look within slicing, it's actually enabling then a range of new services. And I, I would also mention at this point, the enterprise market is a particularly important driver here. So if you can deploy a 5G core uh, for private use for a specific enterprise, and if you can do it quickly, you can do multi-instant or even instance or even multi-tenanted. You know, they're becoming to be key drivers, key conversations that we're having. And then within those slices, you've got things like fixed wireless access is, is popular, not universally popular. I think some service providers see opportunity. Some see maybe um, issues with the network on fixed wireless access, but it's their slicing certainly enables that. And then gaming, interestingly enough, which is, you know, often held up as a poster child for low latency, um, high speed. But providers are now looking at gaming as being a key differentiator for them if they can offer the most optimal network for mobile and fixed gaming, again, using things like network slicing. And then finally, one of the conversations that we're having is around drone delivery, um, which is here. Uh, it's happening in some countries. And again, those drones being able to use you know, drone specific slices on a 5G network are the key drivers. So there are conversations that we're having now. And I think it shows you know, once the SA core is in place, the types of services then that our customers are looking at deploying to fully leverage that 5G and 5G standalone core. Okay, excellent. So these are the, the services talked about for many years uh, coming to reality. Uh, Dimitris, what, what's your observation on, in terms of, uh, you know, what kind of impact this is actually having on the operators on a day-to-day -day basis? Obviously, like Fran mentioned, you know, there are long-term benefits like slicing voice over a new radio and so on but you know there are actually practical improvements that are available today to uh, subscribers for example there are cases where uh, 5g spectrum is lower frequency than 4g spectrum right and you know when using nsa there's a need to anchor to that uh, 4g spectrum meaning that 5g coverage suffers because of 4g uh, deployments and using SA and going to SA and anchoring the 5G radio to a 5G core means that there is immediate improvement in terms of coverage for these systems, right? So that's just one example. And overall, the more efficient use of spectrum, and because NSA doesn't introduce inefficiencies in terms of you know using different types of spectrum. So spectrum is an important uh, effect. And I guess this translates to an immediate benefit for subscribers. So I think this is something that many operators around the world will be contemplating as well. OK, great. So, uh, Fran, Dimitris, thanks very much for joining us today and sharing your insights on the transition to 5G standalone. Thanks very much.